Welcome back to an early morning edition of The Debrief, the competition climbing podcast with more viewers than the Seoul World Cup. I'm here, as always, with John Bergman, and the gimmick this week is uh, we're featuring your comments and your feelings about the World Cup that just happened in Korea. Um, first of all, John Bergman uh, covering climbing, uh, competition climbing for climbing.com and the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Find it at a bookstore near you. Uh, yeah, John, how are you doing? And uh, what were your feelings about Korea just off the top before we get to the... the uh, they always tell you don't read the comments. And of course, this week was all about reading the comments. Probably a mistake. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I got my uh, celebratory <laughs> Korean flag here. Um, I thought, th well, first of all, let's mention the the venue for this. Uh, sure, stunning. Yeah. Like this... I mean, it was man-made, but nonetheless, it was this like waterfall rainforest park. And, I gotta and, say, it is more impressive when they don't tell you it's man-made. That kind of puts a, a bit of a, 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 a it, it tones it down a bit, but yeah. Yeah, kind of like a Disneyland feel or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But nonetheless, it was just this like forest grove with, you know, this, and in the middle of it, there's the climbing wall. It was just really something. Definitely, I think, up there with the coolest climbing venues for these World Cups. It was really mm -hmm. impressive. Best um, use of a drone as well. Like, I mean, if you did that in Salt Lake City, you would have been panning back on a parking lot surrounded by junkyards and shit. So, yeah, this was a good place for that. Yeah, and um, and it seems like from reading the comments from the competitors, they all had a really nice time in Korea. They all enjoyed the, the country and the culture and all that. So that was cool. The event itself, I think there's a lot to talk about. I, I'm sure that uh, the main headlines we'll get into I'm, I'm imagining a lot of um, a lot of people are thinking about Team Japan, Indonesian speed climbers, Natalia. There's a lot to discuss. There was some good stuff. There was some some maybe not so good stuff that we can chip away at. But overall, I really enjoyed the event, and I think it very nicely, for reasons we will discuss, set up the Salt Lake City World Cups that are coming up in just about a week or two. So um, good stuff. Thumbs up for me. Yeah, and before we get started, speaking of which, uh, barring a negative COVID test, uh, or barring a positive COVID test, pardon me, I will also be in Salt Lake City. So if any of you are down there and uh, and you want to uh, uh, meet up for a few minutes and uh, and chat about climbing at one of the World Cups, uh, drop us a message in Discord. Uh, you can find the link to the Discord in the description below. Uh, otherwise, yeah, let's do this. So we uh, we sent out uh, a call for your comments for your headlines from the event, as well as your big winners and your big losers. You might have submitted them via Instagram or in the Plastic Weekly Discord linked below. Uh, we're we're going to kind of go, I guess, by the, the most common topics and head down and uh, and decide which comments are, are great and which ones are, are ridiculous. So we'll start with the headlines, as we always do. And, and the big one here that nobody could really avoid was... Well, I'll just I'll just put it as uh, as some uh, some others put it. The circuit climbing says J Japanese domination is the headline. Uh, Dennis Williams says Team Japan dominates once again. Shep Dawson says Japan dominates and Victor Baudron misses finals by seconds. That's the one mention of the Canadians. So uh, uh, I'll I'll enjoy that while while it lasts. Nobody else bothered to bring it up. Uh, Nevtrick says is this a World Cup or Boulder Japan Cup? Kairos Climber says utter dominance by Indonesia and Japan, and so on and so on. Uh, but Kyra P says Japan is taking over, knowing that most of the Japanese men participating are able to make finals if they have a good day. It was massively impressive to see them all coming together and nearly sweeping the men's finals completely. Makes one think that shorter travel and finally comps back in Asia also have an influence on that. And it's great to see that we are now able to have World Cups far more spread out than just Europe and North America. Well said. Uh, yeah, is uh, is is Japan? Uh, is that the headline from this event? I feel like it probably is for most folks, right? Yeah, I think so. I certainly in the men's division, the women's div there were I think eight men making um, semifinals, something like that, and there were three women. So the men, the men's division was far more dominant in the in that sense for Team Japan. I will be the first to admit I've said on this show in the past that I. I've been wondering whether we might be nearing the beginning of the end of Team Japan's dominance. We, we've seen some competitions in the past where they didn't have the numbers that they did years ago in terms of finalists or semifinalists. And yet here we are. I will be the first to kind of eat my words that it seems like 
what's old is new again. Here we are once another season where Team Japan is is just crushing. I think the interesting thing for me, well, there are a couple interesting things. First of all, the the fact that some of the names were new names or younger names that we haven't really seen a lot in the past, particularly um, Mia Aoyagi in the women's division and um, Satoni Yoshida in the men's division, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, 17, 18 years old and 17 year old, respectively, I believe. And so that continues this trend of Japan just being this assembly line where every year they're able to churn out seemingly one or two new <laughs> new names that goes on to be a, a mainstay in the finals. We'll see if that's the case with with any of the people from this event. But um, yeah, awesome stuff from from Team Japan, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm going to save some of my thoughts for the for the winners category because of course Team Japan comes up again uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, category of discussion, but I think a, a big one just from the weekend in general was uh, it was it was ex really nice to have an Asian World Cup again that featured so many Asian climbers. Korea had a great showcase. Unfortunately, none of their boulders made finals, but they were prominent in semifinals. They had athletes making it through to the finals of the speed event. Indonesians absolutely crushed the the speed event uh and of course the japanese and the bouldering so it it was nice and it I, for speed climbing particularly it does feel like there's a bit of a reorientation to the center of gravity in speed climbing heading eastward right now where it was a little bit further west particularly when russia was still part of the sport um but with russia heading away and the indonesian team looking like they're getting a bit more support in speed climbing and showing up more often uh, it does seem to say that that specific discipline is uh, that Pacific discipline, that specific discipline is heading towards the Pacific, I guess, is kind of what I mean to say. And so it was great to have uh, an event in Asia to uh, uh, to showcase that. Hopefully it won't be the last time that, uh, that we're in Asia this year. We'll see how it all plays out. But that was really fun. It was nice to see just a continent in general get a chance to showcase kind of on home soil. Um, as much as Koreans may not have enjoyed being absolutely dominated by the Japanese and bouldering, uh, but enough world history. Uh, we can leave that till next time. Uh, but <laughs> Well, uh, the, the interesting thing, too, is the big what if what if we had had that event in Japan that was postponed, right? We were supposed to have already had a, a World Cup in Japan. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting to see, would that have been yet another case of Japan just sending multitudes to the finals in the men's division. Essentially, would this would would we be talking about two events now where Japan has been incredibly dominant uh, and, and this return to kind of a lot of Asian competitors in the finals and all that stuff rather than just this one this one event? It's who knows? I think it would have been awesome to have two Asian events back to back. That would have been really something else. And I think you would have seen higher attendance, which is one of the points I want to mention when we talk about the big winners. And although I, I will certainly see that the Asian climbers is the headline, whether or not Team Japan is as big a winner as we think it is, is, is maybe something I want to discuss when we get to the next category. Um, but for now, what else did people say? Uh, interesting comment from from someone from the Slovenian national team. Uh, their headline was women comps being fun to watch because no Yanya. I was curious how you felt about that idea. Like, are the comps more fun now that Yanya has gone? Because I don't feel that way. I No, I, I don't know how serious that comment. I, I don't know if there was a little a little. Oh, sure. Yeah, jokiness yeah, yeah, yeah. in there, because I think to say that is then you have to also say the inverse is true, which is that competitions are not really fun to watch when Yanya mm. is in them, which yeah. of course is, is ridiculous. And I, and I'm sure that the person that wrote that would agree. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a totally different dynamic now with Yanya absent. And I don't think it's necessarily better or worse. I, I, I think I am reminded of something that I think it was Eddie said on the last discord, uh, or it might've been a, uh, Natalie Barry, I, I cannot recall, but something about how Yanya still feels a little bit underappreciated, and I think that this kind of speaks to that. Just the fact that he, we would be saying, "Yeah, it's more fun when the potential greatest of all time is not there." It's like, again, comparisons are odd to other sports, but it's like saying, "Like, yeah, basketball's more fun when Michael Jordan's not playing or mm -hmm. something." Like, you're like, "What? This is a once in a lifetime." athlete potentially in Yanya Garnbread. We should, I mean, it's just, we should feel fortunate and blessed that we get to live at a time when she is crushing and so dominant. She's the type of athlete that 
we'll be old and gray and telling our grandkids like, yeah, I got to, I got to watch her in real time do all this. So of course it's wonderful when Yanya is part of the circuit. I don't think anybody would argue with that. It is different though. Like I said, with, Natalia um, or, or anybody else, but seemingly Natalia is kind of the one that's um, taking the baton, so to speak. It almost feels a little bit like the watching the events, the World Cup, particularly the lead circuit of 2016. If any uh, debrief listeners or viewers remember that, that was the year when Yanya, she won a lot of events, but it's she was still kind of on the come up, right? Like it still felt like she was new that we didn't really know her ceiling. She was dominant, but we were kind of like, well, how dominant is this going to be a season after season thing? We just didn't know. And yeah, and it kind of feels that way with Natalia where she is incredibly dominant. She's so, shown some consistency this season and connecting it to last season. But there's still a question mark of like, well, how exactly does Natalia compare to Yanya when they're when you're looking at uh, when all their they're both their respective careers are going to be finished? How are they going to shape up? It's exciting. It, it's it really kind of feels to compare to Yanya, kind of like Yanya 2016. That's interesting because uh, to me, the two sides of the coin that you mentioned are, are so connected. And and I so I just I, I am, am like you. I disagree that Yanya being gone makes it better. Um, because to me, the, the whole point is if she's that good, I want to see her win it until somebody takes the crown. Like I want to see them rip it from her hands rather than her stepping back and just, you know, throwing it on the, throwing it on the table for whoever wants to fight for it. And and that's the one thing with Natalia is I, I think I'd honestly enjoy it more if I got to see her struggle through maybe a couple years of having to really, uh, uh, fight this this incredible climber for those wins uh like she did that one time last year uh that makes it more valuable and and f- frankly they're they're you know maybe <laughs> maybe she never gets that title of best climber of the uh, of that time maybe she never wins the the world cup championship because Yanya just squats on that throne thrown for so long and Natalia becomes one of the best climbers ever to have not won something that big so to me all around not having Yanya is a downside and I think you're entirely right not necessarily this commenter but if if that's the attitude people have I I think you're right that they are not appreciating uh what we have in the moment and how rare it is to have something like this although maybe in female climbing it's not that rare it's kind of like once every 10 years we get something this cool but Yanya could be the the best we've ever had so uh, who knows yeah I think that's totally fair it's uh, setting up I will say to close it's setting up a really exciting return for Yanya because Yanya she crushes, she's dominant, and then she takes a break. And Natalia, so far, we'll see if it continues, but um, Natalia has has crushed, looked pretty dominant, at least in this this competition. So by the time Yanya returns, it's just all the pieces are being put in place for a an epic showdown between Yanya and Natalia when they do finally eventually, if they do finally eventually meet in a competition in a finals at some point down the road. I think it'll be interesting if Yanni keeps doing what she did like last season and this season where she shows up at the start of the season, just wins dominantly and then says, okay, peace out. See you guys next year. I'll prove it again, you know, in, uh, in March. And then you guys can fight over the scraps kind of thing for the rest of the year. But uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, of course, one of the other headlines is as, as Albert Oak puts it, speed, 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 speed. Uh, and uh, someone else says two new world records. Oh, and there was a Boulder Comp too. Um, of course, we got two new world records. Uh, I, I was going to say if you blinked, you miss it, but it's not your fault if you missed it because we don't broadcast qualifiers, and that seems to be when the records fall. But uh, Kiramal Katabin hit five point one seven eight, and Ola Miroslav hit six point six four eight seconds. Uh, both in the qualification round. So we're really chopping down those those speed records. The women's one in particular has been dropping like, uh, you know, I, I've completely run out of idioms today. I can't finish a phrase. But man, the, the time is being chopped in the women's speed record. It's pretty unreal this last uh, couple of years since like 2019. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> that, that kind of speaks to Reza's record. The fact that he set that thing in 2017 and it was just so otherworldly that it stood for several years after that, because that's kind of the opposite of what we're seeing with the the women's world record. Uh, the, it was interesting. I can't help but wonder 
does speed kind of get shorted a little bit because it is broadcast, it is live streamed first. In other words, if bouldering had been first and then speed was last, I think more of these people that wrote in with these headlines would have been saying speed, speed. I, I just feel like sometimes speed gets the greatness of the speed moments gets lost in the shuffle a little bit because it's immediately kind of covered up by the bouldering stuff. Yeah, I think that's fair. And like speed gets a total coverage of like one hour where bouldering has a cumulative of, of something closer to like probably seven or eight hours across all of semifinals and, and finals. Finals felt long this time around, man. But yeah, I think that's, I think that's, you know, a reasonable comment. Um, yeah. Or even just, I mean, they, I, I'm sure they have a good reason for scheduling it the way that they do, but yeah, I think having it later would just give people time to warm up. Like it was broadcast at like 7 AM on Friday here. It was kind of like a yeah. really early weekday event. So can't blame you to, uh, uh, to not watch it live, uh, for sure. Um, but I mean, they're so short, it's easy to tack into your schedule if you care to. I just think it's like a relatively underviewed discipline here in North America still, unfortunately, but certainly one of the highlights. And I mean, of course, the other sweep that we only touched on earlier is that the Indonesian men swept the speed podium. Um, it was kind of a wacky podium. It sucks to have a false start in in finals. Uh, it would have yeah. been nice for Kiramel to, to get the world record plus a gold medal, but that'll have to wait, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, are we going to call that when you do when you set a world record and you win? Are we going to we should call that the Miroslaw? Is that what that's going to be the the doing that because um, she did it and Kiramal came close, but uh, yeah, what a quirky final race that mm -hmm. was. Um, I think it kind of caught the judges off guard. It certainly caught Matt. It Drew always off guard. does. It always. It, I think yeah. everybody, like everybody, knows the rule for dealing with a false start. But when it happens in a final, everybody's like, "Fuck me! Is it really the rule that this is just over now?" And everyone's like, "Oh shit! Can we like can we make an exception and let them run again, please?" Like it, it really just does suck, man. Yeah, and that's the big knock on. If there's a knock on speed climbing, one of them is the fact that the false start just results in an automatic berth for the other competitor because it's all you always hear speed climbing compared to the hundred meter or hundred yard dash for track and field in which case it's similar usually which is a false start the competitor is disqualified but there's still always six or eight you know, competitors mm. in that heat yeah so it's, it's still a race it's, right it's not like the to the heat is completely busted because of one false start there's still plenty of other competitors that run against each other but with speed climbing, it's just head to head, one on one, two people, one false start, and and it wrecks the whole race. And so, I mean, until we build a speed wall that has six lanes or something like that, which would be pretty epic, I kind of surprised it hasn't been something like that it hasn't been constructed yet. Maybe for the next Olympics, we'll see something like that with six side by side lanes. But until that happens, I don't really see any solution to this this technical quirk where one false start and and the the race is ruined but but that's not even what we're talking about here we're talking about the the quirkiness of having both competitors false start mm -hmm. luckily they re-ran it rather than just going back to count back to the previous race mm -hmm. um yeah it was weird yeah. Yeah. Final. yeah, it was a mess, mess all around. Uh, but otherwise, it, otherwise, it was a great speed round, actually, like ignoring that one particular uh, uh, race between uh, uh, Vedrick and, uh, and Kiramal was pretty good. Uh, all in all, Emma Hunt looking like she might be a consistent player. I think that's really interesting. You know, I, I, uh, it takes a few races for me to get really psyched about somebody, but, uh, but she's looking like uh, somebody that you could maybe count on, um, which I, I wanted to mention just because it's not going to come up in big winners almost certainly. But for the Canadians, man, if Canadians keep placing high in semifinals, I'm going to start expecting Canadians in semifinals, which is something I haven't said for a couple of years, frankly. Uh, that's really fucking cool, man. I'm yeah. really proud of Victor uh, uh, this weekend. Of course, uh, uh, Madison a couple weeks ago. Um, we'll see what happens in Salt Lake City. I know they're shuffling through the team. So at each event, we get slightly different competitors at each one. And uh, man, the kids are showing up. And the, the other thing I'll mention real quick is it is, uh, you know, Sean McCall can compete for however long he wants. You know, if he's if he's still outperforming most of these kids, which he is, he's welcome to show up. But I'm I'm so interested to see that he's starting to get mentioned by these athletes when they're talking about their successes, how they're they're 
you know, thanking him for his mentorship and all this stuff. And I think I think that's going to be really interesting to see. I wonder how long it's going to be before Sean McCall is, you know, the head coach for Team Canada. Not that we're struggling for for coaches or anything, but uh, but he's. It seems like he is already adding value to all of those athletes, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if Team USA can say the same thing. I don't think you guys have that veteran competitor traveling with the team in the same way that we do and that's kind of something that i think we need to make sure we value while we have it so uh yeah just uh that quick little add-on comment yeah that's that's an interesting i don't think team usa really has the that type of com- i i mean you would say i i guess like sean bailey would be the veteran in terms of ifsc uh, pursuits it, which is crazy because he has like no mileage compared to somebody like sean mccall has been in it for like a decade right you know like yeah. traveling the world living uh living outside winning winning events and stuff like that for for so long so yeah yeah and and he's also significantly younger than sean mccall so you can't really compare him i i think mm. i guess it would you'd have to say it would be it would be somebody like alex puccio or alex johnson but neither of them are are really involved in the international competition yeah. circuit anymore so yeah. i don't know yeah and of course josh larson has competition experience just sure. i'm not going to pretend it's at the same level obviously and he wouldn't either uh let's talk about big winners because we're on a bit of a time crunch uh again japanese men and this is this is where i wanted to dig in a little bit more uh the short beta says team japan for five out of six men's finalists uh, and six out of 12 in both categories plus the podium sweep uh nate says team japan don't think much needs to be said about it but six out of 12 spots in bouldering finals is a win when last comp it seemed like maybe they were maybe losing their dominance kind of what you were just mentioning uh uh zl sudar says the japan climbing team no jet lag equals no problem uh yeah of course uh there's a good chance that these guys are the big winners but this is the point i wanted to bring up here some other people are going to mention in the loser how um that the field felt relatively small at this event part of that maybe being due to the european cup that was held in italy at the same time but you know you and i have noticed that there were a lot of athletes that didn't make this uh, leg of the trip which is reasonable because depending on where you are it's a really long trip for a single world cup which has always been a bit of a a, um, a bit of a deterrent for competitors in their season not necessarily wanting to do a big travel for for you know a single competition um so just thinking about it who are the people that would stop team japan from sweeping a podium and it is people like Jakob Schubert, who chose not to participate. It is people like Adam Andra, who we have yet to see this season. Um, it is people like maybe Sean Bailey, who also chose not to participate. There's a couple of the guys that went to the European uh, Cup. Not too many, mostly talking about Yerne Kruder, but, you know, Simon Lorenzi, um, uh, 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 um, Yannick Floey from from Germany. They were at the at the European Cup. So the, the Japanese... Uh, winning as like a big win thing i feel it can be maybe knocked like turned down a little bit just because the attendance was relatively low this was one of the lowest attended world cups we've had in a while and uh and of course the japanese team was there in full force for obvious reasons so i'm not sure it's as big a win as as some people are saying it's always nice to sweep a podium it is a rare occasion um but i think i think there is reason to kind of like temper uh how big an achievement it is in this case yeah, I think I would agree. I, I think it's okay to say it's a big win f- for Team Japan for this event. I think, to your point, it might be faulty to try to draw some longitude from it into the rest of the season. Um, because not only Sean Bailey, you mentioned for Team USA, though, Colin Duffy wasn't there. Nathaniel Coleman pulled out uh, before starting because of, a. I guess, he's dealing with a little finger injury. So it was a kind of a diminished field that it, it's likely – the field in additional competitions won't be quite as diminished, but that'll be something really exciting to see. It will, it will be fun to see if, if Japan does continue to send or can continue to send three, four, five finalists, you know, five competitors into the finals. That'd be, that'd be a, a shoe in for our end of season awards. When we're talking about the team, kind of the best team, if, yeah. if Japan can be consistent with this, that'd be really impressive. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the other big winner that gets mentioned is, of course, Natalia. Um, Kara P says, Natalia, after Yanni's absence, a lot of people uh, were expecting her to finish on the top spot. Pretty impressive mental game just to keep everything together. 
Um, there was uh, another one of the same. Uh, Dennis Williams says Natalia because her first time being the favorite, she overcame the pressure. Uh, that's an angle I wanted to ask about because I was I you know maybe I just didn't think about it that way. But to me, it's almost like the I, I guess there is a little bit of pressure now that she is in this. I would completely agree that she was the favorite for this competition. But do you think that out outweighed the fact that now really the 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 only person that's really beat you in earnest just walked away? I'm. I'm not sure if that's uh, if uh, if the pressure was was more than that benefit. Yeah, that's a, that's tricky because I keep going back to what we always say is that you cannot judge a competition or a performance by who is not there, mm -hmm. right? So it's almost like the fact that Yanya is not there, you you have to just take that out of the equation completely, which of course is impossible to do because we're talking about the potentially the greatest of all time. So it's like you can't. You can't just discard that, um, discard that she's not there. That is a huge, significant plot point to all this. Um, but I, I would agree with the comment. I, when I was looking at Natalia's win, what I thought was really interesting is, is okay, she is the heavy favorite going into this. She feels a lot of pressure going into this, presumably, um, and yet she still manages to execute. And not only execute, but kind of blow everyone else out of the water. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something we've heard before? Oh, I don't know, with a certain Slovenian climber who, who happens to have fuchsia hair and stuff like, like it. It just it's it added to the comparisons of Yanya and Natalia. The the fact that there was this pressure on her, the fact that she she was the favorite, and she and she meaning Natalia was still able to execute. And, and look head and shoulders above most of the other women, frankly. That was very Yanya-like of her to do that. And um, so it's, it's funny because as much as Yanya is separated from this competition, it's like the more that happens, she, Yanya just keeps kind of being drawn back, tethered to it more and more. I think Salt Lake City will be interesting because, of course, there's the notorious, you know, just home field advantage for some reason when you're when you're visiting, you know, the, the middle USA, uh, just the metal seem to just rain upon the laps of uh, American climbers. So, yeah, I mean, assuming Natalia keeps up the form that she's shown for the last couple of years, I'm, I'm willing to bet she is, you know, by the head and shoulders, the favorite for the World Cup championship this year after Salt Lake City. I think it's at the point where the expectation is she should win both of those events. Um, and it, it it feels like we need to see more from the other athletes in order for them to get a win. Right. Um, I don't think it's I don't think that's kind of an unreasonable statement. It feels like that's what the vibe is at this point. Are, are we in a fa a place now which we've been in the past? I remember we've talked about it on this show with with Yanya. I think maybe when we were talking about our Olympic predictions, actually, where you we were saying it's it's not enough that another competitor has to step up. We're in a place now where Natalia would really need to probably mess up a little bit. I mean, we kind of saw that in this event with she had as dominant as she was. She actually had a, a mini little comeback, right, because she couldn't dial in the dyno on women's one in the finals on her first attempt. She couldn't stick that, that match on the mm -hmm. slopey uh, on the edge of the purple volumes. And so she, she got it on her second attempt, I believe. And, and that put her behind uh, Orion and Stasha, I think in the score. So Natalia actually had to kind of come back. And I'm wondering if we're at the place where, yeah, like for other people to win now, they're going to have to climb extremely well as Stasha and Orion did, but Natalia is also going to have to mess up a little bit. Are we there? Yeah, I don't think it's as as much as it was with Yanya because Yanya just built up such a long record of consistency, and often it felt head and shoulders. It felt like okay, every, you know, here's all these people that topped the problem, and then here's Yanya that flashed it without a second thought. She barely made eye contact with the holds, right? And I don't think Natalia is at that level yet. The other thing to say is I don't feel like the root setting is adjusted fully for this new field i think i think the setters are going to need a couple more events possibly to figure out what a proper set final is now that yanya is not around um so when when that settles in maybe maybe there is more separation maybe there maybe there's less i'm not really sure um but 
you know, a lot of these boulders were pretty easy at the bottom and it came down to, can you get it on your second or third try? Like, you know, there, there weren't too many flashes. I thought the balance of flashes, the tops was pretty good, but it was always like, okay, you didn't flash it. Well, you got it on your second attempt. Um, and so I, I, I thought it was like, you know, it, it was maybe a little bit easier than I wanted to be. So we'll see how it plays out. I don't think it's anywhere near the Yanya level just yet. Um, we'll see. I think, I think with a good day from Orian or, or Brooke in particular, um, they can, I think they can easily match or, or beat Natalia. And I'm hoping it happens at least once this year. Like, I mean, come on, it's, I, I don't want us to be in a spot where there's really only just like one female former winner in the field again. I'm not counting Miho because she doesn't seem to be, you know, anywhere near where she was before. Um, but if there's really just like one former winner again, I don't like that. I want to see like multiple, you know, past winners duking it out, trying to like, you know, get the glory back. Right. So. Yeah. yeah, and that, that dovetails with a discussion of Orion because it's interesting that we find ourselves now in a kind of a similar situation with last season where she, last season, if you recall, she crushed at the beginning of the season and then there was kind of this little dip in performance. We don't know why. Maybe it was just harder competition. Maybe she was feeling some pressure or maybe it's just that's how it goes, right? Like it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly hard to stay consistent, of course. So no uh, no knock on her in that sense. But but there was a little bit of a dip last season compared to the, the start of the season for her. This season, she started out, I think she got fourth in Mayringen, if I remember correctly, and she podiums here at uh, at Seoul. So she's she's kind of in the same template as last season so far in starting strong, it's going to be really interesting to see whether she is a little more consistent with her, her performance throughout this season, or if there is another, another dip for whatever reason. Uh, I'm very curious to, to track that. We got a heart out. So I want to, uh, I want to cover a couple other points that people mentioned. And if there's any of them that you want to expand on, uh, just, uh, just mention them uh, real quick. Somebody points out uh, uh, Manu Cornu's uh, quick little, <laughs> protest uh to the paywall there's be more to talk about in the big losers about the broadcast i'm sure uh people talking about the speed climbers of course um uh, ilveto jr says big win is the korean speed climbers just being in the finals which was awesome uh uh mk singh saying also both world record breakers in speed of course the short beta says emma hunt fighting her way up from the bottom half of the finals bracket to silver uh, what else? Uh, Anonymous says speed climbing for getting a decent stream of a good event, two new world records. And even though those were in qualities, they did manage to get video. Although Ola's was from someone's phone, still overall pretty good. It gave me the real feel of a speed comp. Um, aside from speed, uh, some, a bunch of comments about the venue, how nice the venue was. Like you mentioned, Kairos Climber says Seoul, the host city world cups are back in Asia. It's been a while. Um, uh, uh, MK Singh says venue looked fantastic and they handled the downpour well. Uh, yeah. A a any, any of those you want to comment on? Boy, there's some great stuff there. I'm, uh, I appreciate everybody writing in. That's a lot of good lists of winners. I think the mention of this, the Korean team's speed, uh, sending so many speed competitors, uh, um, to this event and doing pretty well is really exciting. I wrote down, um, in the men's division for Korea, um, uh, Sung Bom Lee and Yong Jun Jung and Min Su Kang all finished in the top 25 for the Korean men. Uh, Ji Min Jong, He Ju No, and, and So Yeon Park all finished within the top 25 for the women in speed. And several of those are 17 years old, 18 years old. So that was really, it's cool to see some, some youngsters. I think that it's exciting for Korea because for a long time, as, as much as Korea has been a mainstay on in a finals it's really always been if you look at it kind of based on one athlete right it was like it was for the longest time it was Jain kim and she was really consistent so korea always would have a a, a finalist and then there was a little overlap with um uh jong won um but it was but but then he would make some finals and then of course che on so um so but like I said, it's always kind of been one competitor, really, that's kind of the standout. So it's nice to see now that there is maybe some developing depth on the Korean team and, and multidiscipline, which is really cool. I, the one that I wanted to point out, my big winner was Kokora Fuji from this. And it's really just because I, I kind of just, it went off in my head that he's turning 30 this year. So we're getting into like Killian Fishuber territory of being really relevant 
when you're starting to crack that that age 30 barrier and i'm not gonna like make a comparison because killian dominated and kokoro's always been within these tight fields with you know a lot of uh, kokoro hasn't won a, a boulder season yet maybe this is the year um but I, I wanted to mention that that he's still you know basically leading that japanese team over the last 12 months pretty much uh mm. and uh and he's old he's freaking old guys yeah um, so yeah props to props to the old guys still still kicking it uh, let's talk about big losers. We got about 25, 20 minutes. Um, the big one that everybody mentioned was the stream. Now this is kind of, that's kind of like a vague, uh, way of saying it. So we'll just go through a couple of these. Nate says, uh, it's a tie for me between the commentary and the live stream. I, mean, I feel like we're going to absolutely wreck the commentators, unfortunately, due to some of these comments. So, so, uh, hang in there. Uh, and Nate says, I don't know why they had guest athletes interviewing the winners. It was weird. Alana and Sienna were both great on commentary. Otherwise, uh, but Matt was just annoying me more than usual. This comp, um, I'll, I'll skip some of the other stuff. Uh, Eddie, I, the, the point about having the athletes interview the athletes was, was fair. They've never quite invested that much in, in making sure that the interviewer is fully prepared for that job. Um, uh, man, I'm sign me up for Salt Lake city. If anybody's watching, if you want an interviewer for that, just let me know. Uh, you don't even have to say my name, whatever. We'll just ask some questions and it'll be real words and it'll be fine also get translators that was the other thing i was going to mention is you're in asia surely surely somebody's got a translator that can make those interviews a bit like it's happened so many times before why was it at this event that they didn't have a translator for these athletes like come on they some of them did okay actually their english wasn't terrible but it would have been so much better if they had a translator so i don't know why it's a surprise that the athletes are going to get interviewed when they come first place like figure figure that shit out uh, a couple other comments forward tony says the loser is the viewer uh, Bet Boo says, uh, broadcast blunder strike again. Not even Matt knows if his voice is on Discovery Plus in the UK. Um, she also mentions uh, water leaking out of the wall. Uh, an anonymous viewer says, the communications blunder about semifinals, sending the message. Uh, I think they're referring to um, uh, the geo block being lifted for semifinals. Sending the message when all of Europe is asleep. Seriously, why rub it in? Why don't you? And then adding insult to industry or adding insult to injury. We still can't watch finals. Well, fuck you very much. Stick your sport there. Uh, so that that seems to be the vibe. Half of it is is about the quality of the the broadcast, and half of it is about the uh, sticking it in there, just jabbing you with a free live stream when you're dead asleep. Um, that raised so many questions for me about just like literally the event had started and then an Instagram story going out saying the geoblock is lifted. And that just raises so many questions about the relationship between the IFSC and Discovery. Plus, like, is, is there a clause in the contract that just says Discovery can say, you know, oh, it doesn't have to be exclusive this time. And the two things that were going off in my mind are, one, is Discovery so worried about the quality of the broadcast that they don't want to all of a sudden show part of it? Or they feel like they can't get it broadcast to them somehow? Or are they so you know, not worried about the shit viewership that they're just like, ah, oh, fuck it. You guys can have this one for free, even though we paid for it. Like, I don't even know what that means, man, to just like give up exclusivity with zero minutes warning. That's weird. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know either. I, uh, it's kind of like I said last time we did the debrief, which is I am a little bit unfamiliar with the ins and outs of just Discovery Plus in general and how it's how it's um, kind of held in the in the European market. I'm not based in Europe, so I, I don't I just don't know. Yeah. And on top of that, I certainly don't know the ins and outs of the agreement. Um, I would I, I'd love to chat with somebody from Discovery Plus. If anybody happens to see this debrief, a, 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 <laughs> like a lowly employee there that would want to come on the show and and kind of give us some insight because I am curious about that. And I obviously a lot of the people that sent in those comments are curious about it too. I, it, yeah, it's, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, another comment that came up uh, was about the overlap, like between the European cup and the IFSC event. Um, as far as I know, neither of these events were a surprise. I could be wrong about that. Maybe the Brixen one was a late fill in for a Russian event. So I'm kind of talking out of my ass with this one. It does suck having two events at once. That said, the top level of the field wasn't really that affected. Like again, Yerne Kruder um, and uh, and Yannick Floy were kind of the most notable names. You, I mean, I guess you can say Sandra Lettner. I guess you can say Simon Lorenzi. I guess you can say like Aliska Adamowska. But really, you know, the the likelihood that 
even two of those would have made finals is pretty low. There's a lot of situations where none of them make finals. So I'm not I'm not too worried about that. But I think it did cause uh, just some issues about attendance. And that might be something that the Korean Federation might be a little bit pissed off about is like, you know, OK, we understand we've got one event on a long travel leg and then to uh, to really kick us while we're down, you schedule another event that Europeans feel like they have to go to apparently to qualify for the European championships. I wonder if Korea is a bit salty about that. Um, but honestly, I feel like it didn't affect me, the viewer, that much. I don't think it was the reason for the field being diminished for the most part. I, I've wondered about that, not just with this in this instance, but I've also wondered about this in the past when there have been certain competitions that are held on the same week weekend as World Cups here in the United States. You might have, I don't know, like a some big local competition or divisionals or whatever it is, and it's the same weekend as a World Cup. I I think there's an there is room for that to be some wonderful synergy with a little planning with a little coordination and and a little um like broadcast unity. I I think it 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 could be kind of cool if if the competitions did not line up at exactly the same time. You could you could do something where you're like, "Hey, tune into the this Brixton yeah, event." Yeah, throw it over. Yeah. Yeah, tune into this Brixton event and 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 after as as almost like an appetizer right like mm -hmm. i don't want to diminish what the brixen event was because it was an important thing but like tune into the brixen event and get hyped and then when you're hyped now we have the world cup and you can watch yeah. that and um or if they for whatever reason were at the same time you could in between the you could have moments like, hey, we're at the IFSC World Cup, but here, check out what just happened in Brixen, you know, five minutes sure. ago or what. Here's a highlight yeah. that you that you missed. I just think there's opportunities to, to work together to benefit all. I don't know if it has. Listen, if that's knowing knowing the way we have a control of technology, we'd be watching Tomoa about to land like the, the winning dino and then all of a sudden footage from from fucking Graz wherever Europe just pops up and all of a sudden we're watching some kid I've never seen before struggling on a boulder and we're like, yeah, and here's an update from Europe. That's right. what well, would happen. So maybe we don't. I, yeah, it would need to be coordinated well. Yeah. But um, I, I think it could like, for instance, I was watching the, uh, the Kentucky Derby, big famous horse race was also happening in the United States this past same weekend. And before the big marquee race, they have all these like other little races on the mm -hmm. broadcast that just kind of hype you up for the big one. I, I think something like that could be kind of cool and could be done with these climbing events, especially now that it's easier than ever. Not that it's easy, but it's easier than ever to get live stream feeds, you know, from all around the world and stuff like that. Wouldn't it be nice to be in a sport where the, the main event takes like what? How long does the Kentucky Derby race take? Like a minute yeah yeah it's like, really short yeah. yeah that'd be so much easier than like these four hour finals just add a bunch of fun stuff around it rather than just like uh, is it over yet anyway you, uh, I, was that a, was that a, are, is that you saying that you preferred speed climbing is that what it because those those are the finals you know, that I've, i think like. i've been pretty consistent saying that boulder finals are my least favorite type of rounds to watch just yeah. they take so long and bouldering kind of sucks as much as i like to climb it it is my least favorite discipline to watch the, the, and again it's tilted because this this is obviously the worst time zone issue that i'm gonna have from where i live for viewing a world cup this season by far the worst and normally my rule is i always watch it live because if i don't it's harder to pay attention you've already seen the spoilers you don't enjoy it as much so i really put watching it live like as a priority this was a bridge too far um i was like half asleep i had to give up after the women's finals and go back to bed and watch the men's later so i think i kind of reached my limit where if it's you know if it's a, a 4 a.m start i should probably just watch it later so what i mean to say is uh you know if this event was a bit too long if this event if if this event was a bit too boring i i'm concerned that my perspective of it might have been slanted by how asleep i was while i was watching it so i don't want to add any comments but yeah but that is a, a common knock on bouldering events is it especially if you're trying to sell it to a casual fan a non-invested you know non-hardcore fan it's the stakes are just different. It's like, okay, they get, they, they try it. Okay. They fall. They can rest on the mat. Well, having mm -hmm. them rest on the mat, that's not interesting television or whatever. No. Um, they can try as many times as they want. That kind of lessens the stakes a little bit in the eyes of the casual fan. It's a hard sell bouldering the, the in, yeah. in terms of a, a broadcast. Yeah. It can be really tough. Yeah. I, hey, don't worry, man. Adding an extra zone will fix it. 
We don't know we'll how, see in but we promise. We promise it'll fix it, dude. <laughs> uh, maybe some more. Maybe this could be solved with more math. That's what I always say. Uh, okay, we got three more. Three more loser topics that came up, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna read a quick summary, and then you can. You tell me if there's any you want to touch on. So first of sure. all, a bunch of people had issues with the rain. That rain was the loser. Honestly, I don't have that much to add about that topic. Sure, that's the, yeah, the rain could be the loser. I'm mad, I'm uh, mad at the clouds. <laughs> um, the other big topic was setting, and then the other one was uh, some particular climbers uh, that some people, not, not you know, not being mean to the climbers, as sure. always, the same disclaimer, just like, you know, they didn't have good days. Would you prefer to talk about the route setting or some climbers? Let's talk about, I'm, I'm curious, the climbers that were mentioned. Let's dive all into right. that a little bit. We actually, we got three comments. They're all about different climbers. Uh, SLP7 says uh, the big loser was Miho Nanaka fans with a little sad face. Mm. Um, Dennis Williams says Fanny Gibert, not trying to be negative on her, just missed her in semis. And Lando Alrissian says the biggest loser was Stassi Gejo. She still can't secure the bag. Bag, which is interesting because there are actually a couple people that mentioned Stacy Gejo as the winner for different reasons. One was that she was like still keeping up. One one mentioned that uh, uh, she proves that you don't have to be like, you know, 40 kilograms to make finals. Mm-hmm. Um, little comments like that. So these these were the three competitors that uh, people mentioned. Uh, Fanny, Miho, Stasia. Any comments on these? Were any of them the big loser from this event? Well, I'll preface this by saying that you and I have been on record. We are huge Miho fans. I think pretty much everybody is. She's a really fun to watch. and, and it, um, I. But I think with her, I don't know if I would put Miho in the loser category. I'm kind of, I have her in sort of a holding pattern in my mind. Because I think you could, as some people said, she could go in the loser category. I also think she could go in the winner's category because she significantly improved at this competition compared to Mayringen. I think, what was she, like 27 or there. something like that yeah. <laughs> in Mayringen? And she was eighth here, I believe. Um, so in that sense, it was a huge improvement. But I, she, when you chip away at that a little bit, you look at eighth place, of course, the difference between eighth and sixth, meaning the difference between eighth and making finals is sometimes like a flip of the coin, right? Yeah, it wasn't so much. Wanna, you don't want to chip away at this too much. But nonetheless, eighth place is, as much as it was an improvement for Mayringen, it's still her lowest place since 2017. I think like a like Munich in the middle of the season there, she got 10th um, or something like that. Um, so it's not like she's completely back to her old self here, the, the, where she's been this consistent finalist. I... Like I said, I just it's kind of a holding pattern. I'm I'm very much wait and see with Miho. I hope that she continues to improve. I'd love to see her in a finals and or in several finals, but um I'm not ready to put her in the loser category for this event. I'm not well, ready to put her in the the complete see, winners category. The comment specifically said that the real loser was Miho Nanaka fans. So the question is, are you and I the biggest losers from this <laughs> from from this competition? You and I are always the biggest losers, <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> Uh, th- I thought these three athletes that were mentioned, Fanny, Miho, and Stasio, are really interesting. Like Miho is is one where I have to imagine twenty twenty four Olympics is is something in her mind. Um, and man, it's gonna be a slog. It's gonna be the kind of slog that Akio had to deal with, where you're just like, but God, I wish this would come sooner because I'm really reaching my sunset years and things aren't going as well as they had in the past. And, you know, not necessarily the same in Akio's case, but Mio dealt with a bunch of injuries and it's like, this is, it only gets harder from here. And so while I'd love to see her recover, you, you gotta also say she's reaching just, you know, she's getting towards that end period where you start thinking about something else to do. Um, and it's only harder if you're not hitting the, the pace that you were, were dealing with before. Same thing with Fanny, except Fanny is is a bunch older. And I think, honestly, that one season where Yanya swept kind of maybe skewed people's expectations of Fanny Gibert a bit. Um, I think that was probably her last hurrah was was 2019. I, I wouldn't expect to see her showing up in a finals very often anymore. And Stasi Gayo, I don't know if I'd call her uh, like a, a a loser in this case, although I'm not willing to call her a winner either. Like, as we mentioned last week or last episode, I think that she's got some stuff she's got to deal with if she really wants to get a win. It was nice to see her have some success and in particular, you know, walk off with a, with a nice finish at this finals rather than looking just fuming and furious. Um, but uh 
but there's there's still stuff to work on there. So yeah, she's she's another one where she's got to start figuring stuff out pretty quick because she's not she's not in the upward years of her career. Frankly, she's she's got to figure it out now because you're probably looking at peak Stasia physically right about now. Um, so figure out the head game, otherwise this is as good as it gets. I think. Yeah, and you you also can draw some comparisons a little bit to Stasia this year, twenty twenty two to Akio in 2019, which is to say, if you recall, Akio had a a banner year that year for her career. It was a, f- a phenomenal year. The only problem was that also <laughs> happened to be the year that Yanya was in, sure, yeah. in, in Yanya top form and Yanya swept the bouldering circuit, which is like, oh gosh, if it wasn't for Yanya that year, I, I think Akio would have just had this such a legendary year we're in this year here so far with stasha where it's like yeah she's crushing she's having a banner year herself yeah the only problem is that natalia is um and orianne and brooke right it's not just one yeah. they're pushing you right out of the podium the they're, kids yeah right exactly and so um it's almost like just by no fault of stasha's own she just by by the the randomness of who who she happens to be competing against this year um, unfortunately, it is a it, even with Yanya's absence, it is a stacked field. When you're talking about Orion, Brooke, Natalia, that's a that's a real uh, lineup there. That's mm-hmm. going to be really hard for you to you know, to if you're going to get a, a gold or, or a silver, you're probably not going to have to just beat one of them. You're probably going to have to beat several of them. We'll be cheering for you, but that's uh, that's definitely going to be. It's going to be a big challenge. Yeah. We have a couple of minutes, so let's briefly touch on the root setting. Uh, Professor Oak says the big loser was setting a jug on a men's final boulder. Not what sure he's re- which one he's referring to, but there were certainly a couple. Wonder. Uh, the circuit climbing says the setting, soft finals became one problem shootouts. That's fair. Uh, Steven SS says root setters have two finals boulders with unnecessary zone holds. Casey Wilson says the same thing. She says uh, men's three and women's two zone holds in finals. More useless than a lifeguard at the Olympics. <laughs> well, right. men's, two, <laughs> men's two and three in the finals were kind of a dud. I think... Um, they were topped together collectively. Weren't they topped by everybody except Paul Jemf didn't top one of them, if I remember correctly. Uh, but that was it. Every yeah. Everything else. It was Kaita topped. actually didn't top three. Okay, yeah. sorry. Sorry, Paul. Um, but yeah, those were kind of duds, um, unfortunately. I, I It was one thing after the set, the men's number two. I was like, okay, that was kind of a dud. And then yeah. on top of that, the next one, you're like, jeez, come on. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice that they kind of finished strong on the fourth boulder though. So it, it wasn't yeah. so bad, but yeah, I think the setting is going to take a little bit of time. The zones were so interesting because I'm like, man, we can't even get one zone, right? Why are we doing two? Like what's, what's the deal? I thought the problems were fine. It was, uh, or sorry, the particular problems where the zone hold was useless. I thought those problems were generally fine. I enjoyed watching those climbs actually. Um, yeah. but the, the zone yeah. hold was, was a bit of a, a bit of a laugh. So I, yeah. I liked also they, the wall was very high, as they noted on commentary, which I think made for some pretty scary falls at times. But I I did like that the top holds, going back to semis and finals, the top hold was very rarely a gimme, um, which I always like. I always like when the top is is pretty tough to, mm-hmm. to match. And it did seem like... We had a, several instances of that, which was cool. So that's a. If we're gonna criticize the the setting, I think I also want to give a thumbs up on some of the really difficult tops. Uh, you made me just remember who my biggest loser was. I can't even remember which climber it was, but whoever it was that face planted their own shock bag on the way down in semifinals. That's always great television when you wake up with just the like you know the two face <laughs> thing going on, just completely flowered on one side. That was uh, the biggest loser and the biggest winner, uh, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, do you have anything else to add? But we gotta, I gotta get you out of here. So uh, any final um, comments? I, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think we kind of covered it on my end. I, I thought it was, um, I, I overall thought it was a really enjoyable competition, despite the fact that we did have like, like we said, those duds in the men's finals. Um, I, I thought it was cool. I thought, I think the thing I'll add is that I think Natalia winning and Brooke also making podium sets up Salt Lake City pretty great in terms of at least here in the united states in terms of like fan interest star power all of that stuff i i think that the fact that natalian brooke got 
some headlines, got some Google boosts or whatever you want to yeah. say is, is really good for um, for setting up Salt Lake. For I'll throw, although I, I'm sure the Americans hate speed climbing, but we got I'll throw Emma Hunt in there as well. Like definitely uh, people going to be watching for her too. So it, 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 Emma deserves a, a big thumbs up. It's really mm-hmm. exciting. What's cool to me is Emma has been a big name here on the national circuit. I mean, she's like a multi-time national record holder. So she it's one of those cases of she's been a huge name in the United States and within the U.S. Um, national scene for for many years, but particularly starting with last year, her medal, and then this year, it's really exciting to see her get some some significant international recognition too, and maybe gain some some international fans. and And yeah, she deserves to be right up there with Natalia and 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 Brooke as well. I mean, these three marquee American stars right now. It's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's call it there. Uh, a quick thanks to everybody that sent in their comments. I know we didn't read all of them. We didn't say everybody's names, but I promise we did read all of them. They were all great. So thanks for throwing those in there. We just had a quick show today. Um, I will be uh, in Salt Lake City for the World Cups. I'll actually also be there for CWA. So uh, if you want to say hi, please just uh, say hi. I'm, I'm not outgoing at all. So in person, if I look like I'm totally shut off and not making eye contact, that's who I actually am in real life. So just break through that seal. Just uh, say hi. It'd be nice to, uh, to meet you guys. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Uh, you can follow all of our stuff on this channel. Make sure you subscribe. Chat with us at the next World Cup in the Discord. Uh, I won't be around, obviously, in the Discord for that. I might pop in here and there to give some updates, but uh, the community in there is great. Uh, and of course, you can support the uh, the whole Plastic Weekly project on Patreon. Link in the description uh, below. John, thanks again. Uh, do you have anything you want to say to people that are watching Salt Lake? Because we probably aren't going to do a debrief after the first one but we'll definitely do one after the second Salt Lake to wrap it all up. Um, I'm not bringing all my rig down with me to Salt Lake. I just want to enjoy myself. Uh, so uh, anything you want to say to people that are watching? Cause we're not going to see him for a few weeks. Uh, yeah. Tune in. It's going to be awesome. I mean, Salt Lake city last year was, I think most people would agree. It was one of the most exciting events just because there was such a robust frenzied crowd. Um, and I think, by all accounts, that's probably what it's going to be like this year. So it's definitely one that you'll want to tune in, probably tune in live. Um, it's going to be great. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thanks so much for watching, guys. John, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you guys in the next one.